video. So we have discussed about measures of central tendency as part of the previous module. And we also discussed this specific riddle, wherein say two data scientists go to a jungle for hunting and they see a black panther charging at them. And by looking at this black, black panther, one data scientist will try to release an arrow which misses the panther from the left side, another from the right side. Despite that, both of, both of them start, you know, enjoying, saying that, wow, good job done. Why do you think they both are partying despite missing to hunt down the Black Panther? To explain this, I can probably give you an example of wife and a husband. Say the weight of wife happens to be 120 kilos. Okay. And say, weight of husband happens to be 40 kilos. By looking at this, immediately you can say that wife is overweight and husband is underweight. However, when you take an average of the weights, when you take average of the weights of both of these people, it would be 120 kgs plus 40 kgs divided by 2. And then you get 160 by 2, which is nothing but 80. So on an average, the weight of these couples is 80 kgs. On average, the weight of each person is 80 kgs because you have taken an average. So both of these people will be jumping with joy, saying that, you know what? Individually, if you look at the weight of five, it's 120 kgs overweight. Individually, when you look at the weight of this person, husband, it is 40 kgs. However, when you take average, average happens to be 80 kgs. So that's more or less the right weight. So both of them start partying together. Now, do you know what? Individual, I'm overweight. Wife would say, if you look at only my weight, I'm overweight. And if you look at only your weight, husband, it is uh, your underweight. But when we look at the average weight, we weigh 80 kgs. So that's about right weight. And then they start partying. Right. So averages are always a little tricky. In this scenario also, one person released the arrow, it missed the panther from the left side. Another person released the arrow and it missed the black panther from the right side. But since they are data scientists, since they understand statistics, they assume or they do a calculation saying that Left side, right side. If you take an average, on an average, we would have killed it. It's like 120 kgs, 40 kgs. On an average, it happens to be 80 kgs. So averages are pretty misleading. It's something like you say, I have um, $100 with me. Your friend might say that I have $10 with me. But then this guy who has ten dollars say he's very clever. He might say that. Do you know what, my dear friend? On an average, if you take an average, it's one ten dollars by two, so fifty five dollars. Your friend might say that. Friend, don't worry. On an average, we have fifty five dollars. So let's come. Uh, I mean, let's go and do party. Right. So <laughs> averages are quite tricky. You can use it to your benefit. More, more you know.
uh, most often than not, if you understand statistics better. All right, so let's do a quick recap of the methodology and let us understand where we stand. So we are talking about CRISP-MLQ. CRISP-MLQ is a project management methodology which will help you approach the business problem in a structured manner. CRISP-MLQ has six phases. And the first phase includes business and data understanding. And as part of business understanding, you record the objectives and the constraints we saw we, you also define your success criteria. You record, you should record rather business success criteria, machine learning success criteria, and economic success criteria. And it is always recommended to record your objectives and constraints using two to three words. If you cannot, then four to five words. And the worst case scenario would be a sentence long, but certainly not less than that. Sorry greater than that. You should not have more than one sentence or paragraphs together to record your objectives and constraints. Always try to use the terms minimize or maximize when you record your objectives and constraints. And project charter is the first document which gets created on any project. Once you understand the business problem, you try to solve your business problem by collecting the most appropriate data. And to understand the most appropriate data, we discussed about the various data types in which we concluded that ratio data is the best data type because you can perform all the statistical analysis possible on the planet. However, we also discussed that nominal data would be the least preferred data because you cannot do a lot of analytics when you have nominal data available with you. Then we discussed about all of these various data types, understanding of which is pivotal before you proceed further with data collection. And when it comes to data collection, we have primary data collection and secondary data collection. Secondary data collection is that data which is collected beforehand and that is available for you. You can start using that. You have easy access, right? Data is already available. Go take that and start analyzing. If you do not have the data needed for your analysis within secondary data source, then you need to proceed further with primary data collection mechanism. And as part of this, we have briefly understood surveys and design of experiments. We also have understood a few examples pertaining to social media extraction and IoT sensors. With respect to social media extraction, we have looked at a use case or an example wherein you extract the data from Facebook and then look at various um, attributes on what emotions people exhibit, so on and so forth to determine whether those new features which you extracted would help you predict whether a person will default on the loan or not. Okay, it's obviously, you know, costly and time consuming. But once you have the data available, you need to proceed further with the next step, which is data cleansing or preparation or exploratory data analysis, feature engineering. All of these activities you perform as part of your phase two of CRISP MLQ. Before we started talking about these, we thought, okay, let us get a brief understanding about Statistics 101, in which we discussed about probability, while we discussed about the regular probability, which is number of interested events by total number of events. We are here to talk about joint probability and conditional probability. We will talk about that later. Alongside that, we also discussed about probability distributions. And we know for a fact that when it comes to probability distribution, 
And when you represent that in a graphical format, then on x-axis, you would have a random variable. And on y-axis, you will have probability values. And obviously, probability values range from 0 to 1. If this random variable happens to be categorical data, and categorical is part of discrete, in discrete, you have categorical data and count data. If your random variable is discrete data, then the underlying probability distribution would be called as discrete probability distribution. At the same time, if your random variable happens to be continuous, then you call the underlying probability distribution as continuous probability distribution. Okay, so you have discrete probability distribution and continuous probability distribution. Depending on the underlying random variable, if it is continuous, you call the probability distribution as continuous probability distribution. And if your underlying random variable happens to be discrete, you call this probability distribution as discrete probability distribution. Any graphical representation we are going to talk about, you need to understand and internalize and remember on what would be on x-axis and what be what would be on y-axis. Okay. All right. Then we have also discussed about inferential statistics. What do you mean by inferential statistics? We don't go after the population. Instead, we try to get a sample from the population using some sampling techniques. And then while you analyze the sample, you make statements about complete population. And we also have hypothesis testing, which is another form of inferential statistics. We would certainly touch upon hypothesis testing at a later point of time. And also we will get into some basic math foundations to be able to understand the different techniques in a better manner. So now let's get into step two. Even before we get there, one another point, you know, which I want to reiterate is that typically 60 to 80 percent of the work of a data scientist would be spent in understanding phase one and phase two. It would be in performing activities pertaining to phase one and two. As part of phase two, we try to segregate the stages as data cleansing or data preparation or munging or wrangling or organizing or data pre-processing. All these are the different names. And we have also exploratory data analysis or descriptive statistics and feature engineering for our understanding uh, purpose, we are trying to segregate these three sub stages or sub steps. Having said that, there will be a lot of overlap. Among these three phases, there'll be a lot of overlap in the techniques which we are going to learn as part of phase two. Okay, practically, there'll be a lot of overlap, but Theoretically, yes, we can segregate the stages and that is exactly what we are trying to do here. Even before we understand this A to A, we need to understand exploratory data analysis or descriptive statistics. Once we are clear with this, we will proceed further and understand each and every step of data cleansing or data preparation. And uh, we would also touch upon Feature engineering, which is extremely important concept. So,
So as part of exploratory data analysis, which is famously called as EDA or descriptive statistics, we have all of these phases once again, right? or all of these uh, decisions. We have first moment business decision. We have second moment. We have third moment, fourth moment, and graphical representation. As part of first moment business decision, which is also called as measures of central tendency, we have three. We have mean, median, and mode. As part of second moment business decision, we have measures of dispersion, which is variance, standard deviation, and range. And third moment is skewness, fourth moment is kurtosis. And when it comes to graphical representation, we have univariate, bivariate, and multivariate plots. We have already discussed about mean, median, and mode, which is uh, which are called as measures of central tendency, in which mean is also called as average. And the disadvantage with mean is that it gets influenced by outliers. Hence, when you have outliers in your data set or the extreme values, extremely high or extremely small in comparison to the other values, when you have, you proceed further with median. And median is the middle value of the data set. And median does not get influenced by outliers. So when you have outliers in your data set, median is a better measure. And when you have categorical data, you cannot apply mean or median. You just need to apply mode. Mode is that value which repeats maximum times. If you get a single mode, that means it is unimodal. If you have two modes, it is called as bimodal. And if you have more than two modes, it is called as multimodal. If you have more modes, that means you have clusters. If you have more than one mode, two or three or four or whatever, that simply indicates that you have a lot of clusters in your data set. A lot of related segments within your data set. That is what it means. Okay, mode can also be applied on count data. However, mode is not applied on continuous data. And why is it called as first moment business decision? Because these are the first set of questions which any management person should ask and will ask. Any person who has a structured thought process uh, towards analyzing the data would analyze in this manner. Okay, next. Let us get into something called as measures of dispersion. Measures of dispersion is also called as Second moment business decision. Second moment business decision. Expanding on the same example that we have discussed, say you are head of ASEAN market, Association of Southeast Asia, Southeast nations and nations. Suppose you are head of HSBC Bank of ASEAN market. Then we know for a fact that we have HSBC Bank across the Southeast Asian nations. So say you have your office in Malaysia, you have your office in Singapore, Indonesia, so on and so forth. Vietnam, Laos, so on and so forth, right? So the first question which any head of you know, a bank would ask questions such as, on an average, what are our sales? On an average, what are our profits? On an average, how many employees do we have? On an average, what is our attrition rate? 
so on and so forth. On an average, how many customers churn? Customers churn means they switch from HSBC bank to another bank. That would be, or these would be the first set of questions which any management person would ask. And then the obvious second question is, are the profits across these locations varying a lot? Or are the profits across these locations the same? Are the sales across these locations fluctuating a lot? Or are the sales across these locations constant? Are the number of employees that we have across these locations same? Or is it varying a lot across these locations? Are the number of customers who are churning same across these three locations? Or is it varying across these locations? Is it high in Malaysia, less in Singapore? How? Less in Singapore, how high in Malaysia? So you ask these kind of, kind of questions, which would be the obvious second set of questions which you should ask as a management person. Hence, the measures of dispersion are also called as second moment business decision. You have three measures of dispersion and we'll talk about that later. So let's try to understand using an example, say you have two regions, Malaysia and say Singapore. And you have say sales of a few months of data, probably six months data, right? You have sales for the last six months. Say you have taken that data and you started plotting that. First month sales was say above average. If you have six months data, sales for six months. First month probably it's $1 million. Second month it's $1.2 million. Third month sales is $500,000. And, and, and fourth month it is say whatever. If you have this data, you can obviously take an average of this and the average would come here. And that is this line. This is called as average line. Say for Singapore also, you have six months sales data. If you take the data of all those six months and take an average of that, you get some number. Say when you plotted, this happens to be that. Say first month sales is above average. Second month sales is below average. Third month sales happens to be above average. Fourth month is even higher in comparison to the average sales. The sales for this month has been high. Then next month sales in comparison to average is here. And six month happens to be here. So how far away? is each data point from the mean. How far away is each data point from the mean? How far away is each data point from the mean? Is called as dispersion. Variation. And if you were to just look at this, it will tell you what is the amount of fluctuation that you have visual and then just draw those lines those are the bands within which all the values are lying okay within those bands you have all the various values which are lying suppose you take the data for singapore and start plotting that first month sales is above average second month is below third month fourth month fifth so say you have the data like this. How far away is each month sales in comparison to the average? How far away is each point? 
uh, each point in the sense, each month sales. How far is a, a far, far is that in comparison to the average? How far is the third month sales from average, fourth month sales, fifth month, and sixth month, sixth month sales from the average? You can uh, you can just try to connect all these data points, and you'll understand visually on what is the amount of fluctuation which exists. And then you can draw the dotted lines. And that is the band within which you have your values fluctuating. Okay, so your values are fluctuating within that band. Okay, so now. So if I were to ask you a question on would you be more comfortable forecasting the sales for the next month for Malaysia? Or would you be more comfortable in forecasting the sales for the next month for Singapore? Where would you be more comfortable? If I were to answer that question, I'm sure you would say that you'll be more comfortable in forecasting the sales for Malaysia. Why? Because the amount of fluctuation is less in comparison to the amount of fluctuation in Singapore. Okay, the amount of fluctuation in Malaysia is less in comparison to the amount of fluctuation in Singapore. That means that the variation or uncertainty in the data is less in Malaysia. And the variation or uncertainty in Singapore is high. If you were to forecast the sales for the next month, it would lie in this width. The band or width is very small. However, if you want to forecast sales for Singapore, you have a you know wider width in which data should be a data would be fluctuating. These charts that you're seeing here are called as control charts. If you want to know what plot it is exactly, these are called as control charts. The reason why I'm using this is because I want to push this idea of dispersion. Idea is more important. Thoughts are more important on what do you mean by dispersion. Okay. This specific concept is used in a lot of amazing things. And I'm sure you all are aware of U.S. Food and Drug Administration. When there is any medicine or any food product that you want to market across the globe, especially if you want to penetrate into the U.S. market, then you need to get an approval from U.S. FDA that your drug or the food is not going to harm the people who consume that. Okay, and US Food and Drug Administration standards are very high, they set very high standards. Given this, I have a question for you all. How many of you all like chocolates? How many of you all like consuming chocolates? I'm sure a lot of you all like chocolates. You like to consume chocolates, and I'm certain about that. But then my question would be, in 100 grams of chocolate, how many insect fragments are permitted? Hey, what do you mean by insect fragment? Leg of a cockroach or eye of a cockroach, etc. would be called as insect fragments. How many insect fragments are permitted in 100 grams of chocolate? Insects in chocolates? Oh my God. They won't purposefully put friends. 
But wherever you have chocolate manufacturing plants, no matter how much care they take, insects, flies, they somehow find their way. And probably they'll try to taste chocolate and they fall into the you know, mixture, they get mixed and then it will come up as a chocolate, which we all consume. I'm sure you all want to say that you know, how many insect fragments are permitted? I would say zero. Wow. This is an ideal scenario, friends, but it would not be zero ever. Okay. So to answer this question, let's go and see for ourselves. US, LP, and insects, Wikipedia. It is, I think, um, 60 or more. If you have 60 or more fragments in 100 grams of chocolate, then that chocolate would be rejected. Otherwise, it will not be rejected. Let me show you that. Yep, here we go. So chocolate. On an average, 60 or more insect fragments, if you have, you reject. That's the upper limit. So the lower limit for number of insects that you want to see would be zero. And the upper limit happens to be 60. If you have any value or any chocolate during the you know verification or quality audits, if you find more than 60 insect fragments, then you reject that. Until 60, it is safe to consume. There won't be any health issues. It's a purest form of protein. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, vegetarians out there. But, you know, ask yourself a simple question on did you uh, never eat chocolate? And, and, and I'm, I'm sure you all will say that, okay, so we are not vegetarians anymore. And if you're wondering on what big deal about chocolate, let me ask another question. A lot of people like something called as pulpy orange. Because when you look at the pulpy orange, right, you get the natural taste of pulps, orange pulps. When you sip it, uh, you'll be able to feel the orange pulps and you'll find, I mean, you'll feel that it's very natural. Do you know what is measured in this? Or uh, let me ask this question. In a canned 250 ml citrus juice, citrus means lemon, orange, etc. There is something called as drosophila or fly eggs. Fly eggs are measured. And if the number of fly eggs are more than a certain quantity, that lot would be rejected. But if it is less than the threshold applied, then it is safe to consume. And do you know what? Eggs of a cockroach, sorry, of a drosophila or a house fly would look like this. And you know what? It exactly appears like an orange pulp. You would not be able to segregate on whether that is an orange pulp, which is giving you that natural taste, or is it an egg? If there are people who still believe that they are vegetarians, please let me know. I have a few more examples for you. Okay. The reason why I brought in these examples is because <clears throat> is because I want you all to understand the concept of dispersion. I'm not against vegetarians. You know, uh, I mean, neither am I supporting the non vegetarians, right? This is just to push the idea of dispersion. All right. Now, let's look at the measures of dispersion. Even before this, I wish to go back and show you the formula pertaining to 
measures of central tendency here. here. If you look at the formulae, these two, it is whole raised to the power one. Hence, these measures are called as first moment business decisions. And also since logically, these are the first set of questions that you need to ask, it is called as first moment business decision. However, we have second moment business decision and we have three measures. And those three measures are called as measures of dispersion. You'll have population parameters and sample statistics. If you calculate variance for a population, it would be called as a population parameter. And it is represented using a Greek notation. All the population parameters have a Greek notation. So you're saying, let me take a summation of each value, x is a random value, each value minus mean, mu. This mu is also a Greek notation divided by uppercase n would mean that you are calculating for the entire population. And this symbol here that you see is called as sigma. And you have sigma squared. When you calculate variance for a sample, it is called as sample statistic. Here you have S squared, which is a regular representation or notation. You're saying X minus X bar, because when it comes to sample mean, it is represented using X bar. And here you're having N minus one. Here you have N, here we have N minus one. Whereas when it comes to mean, population mean or population parameter was given as mu is equal to summation of all the values xi divided by n. And when you looked at sample mean, which is a sample statistic, it was represented as x bar. And once again, you add all the numbers and divided by n. Here you have uppercase n and here you have lowercase n and that is the only difference in the formula. However, when it comes to second moment business decision, and when you look at variance, for instance, for population parameter, you have n, whereas for sample statistic, you have n minus one. Why is that? So is a classic interview question to be asked. We are going to talk about that later. Then we have standard deviation, which is nothing but square root of variance. When you take square root of variance, sigma square becomes sigma, square root of that, which is a population parameter. That's why you're having mu, which is population representation and uppercase n. If you take a square root of variance, you get sample statistic. Instead of S squared, we have S. Then we have range, which is nothing but maximum value minus minimum value. Now, we will resort to a spreadsheet and we are going to discuss about Weighting standard deviation and range using an example. So let me pull out a spreadsheet here. And um, we shall talk about this. Suppose you have a data set when you have weights of people in kilograms. First person weight is say 10 kgs. Second person's weight is 20 kgs, and you have the weight of third person, which is 30 kgs. Say there are only three people on the planet, Adam, Eve, and the kid. Assume that there are only three people on the planet for now. So, first of all, what do you mean by variance? 
How far away is each point from the mean? If you remember. When we spoke about the dispersion, we looked at how far away is each value from the mean? How far away is each value from the mean, right? That's dispersion. And that is exactly what we discussed. So first of all, let me calculate mean. If you calculate mean here, formula is simple. Add all the numbers and divide by the total count. So it'll be 60 by three, which would be obviously 20 kgs. But I'm just showing you the Excel formula. And what is variance? How far away is each value from the mean view? And then you would get in kgs. If you say how far away is 10 from average, you get minus 10 kgs. How far away is 20, which is a data point from the average, you get zero. So it is zero kgs. There is no variation of the, or dispersion in the second entry because on an average, the weights are 20 kgs and you also have a value 20. So it'd be exactly one on top of another. So you get zero. How far away is this third data point, which is 30 kgs from the average? When you solve that, you get 10 kgs. Now, when you try to add these numbers, because you want to look at the dispersion across all the data points, not just single data point to the mean, all the data points to the mean, you want to look at how far away each value is from the mean, right? That is exactly what we want to look at. So when you add all these values that would capture the distance of each point from the mean. So if you take a, a basically summation of this, you get zero. Minus 10 plus zero plus 10. If you take the summation of these values, you get zero. What does that mean? Does this mean there is zero dispersion in the data? Not really. Because there is dispersion in the data. You have 10 kgs, 20 kgs, and 30 kgs. That means values are not the same. There is some variation. Okay. However, if you subtract each value from the mean, and then when you add those values, you get zero. That means there is no variation. But which is wrong, in the underlying data, there is variation. So now, intelligent people, statisticians, mathematicians, economists, people like you, who are experts at, at analytics, thought that, okay, let's do one thing. Let us take x minus mu whole square. Let us square these values. And when we square these values, what will happen? Let's see. If I take this number, and when you square it, you get 100. If you take this value, and when you square it, you get 0. In that way, if you keep taking values, and if you keep squaring them, Once again, yep. Yeah. So if you take the values and if you square them, you get 100. And you know what? Since you're squaring, the units also get squared. So you get kg square, kg square, and then kg square. Because you're squaring this, the units also get squared. Okay. So the problem is gone now. Now, if you look at the average, okay, because uh, when you look at the formula, right, this is how the formula would look like. 
summation of i equal to 1 until m x i minus mu whole square divided by m. How many values do you have? 3. So you write it as summation of i equal to 1 until 3, which is n equal to 3, x i minus mu whole square divided by n equal to 3. When you substitute i equal to 1, you get x1 minus mu whole square. Since you have summation, you say plus. i equal to 2, when you substitute, you get x2. So x2 minus mu whole square. Summation means plus. When you substitute i equal to 3, you get x3 minus mu whole square. And you divide it by 3. This is what we do. And what did we do here? We have done xi minus mu whole square, which is x1 minus mu whole square would give you this. x2 minus mu whole square would give you this. x3 minus mu whole square would give you this. And now you need to divide it by 3 because you have three values. So if I were to add all these three values, 100 plus 0 plus 100, you would get 200. Divide it by 3. When you do that, you get 66.67 or 66 kgs squared. Units are getting squared. So let me write it as variance. This is called as variance and variance is denoted using sigma squared. This is your variance. So now that you have variance, let's understand this. 66.6, let's see. Okay, 10, 20, 30, certainly there is variation in the data, but we don't have such large variation. Here, when we, when we look at that, we feel that the variance is extremely high. That is because we are squaring the values and hence units are also getting squared. This is the disadvantage with variance because units get squared. If someone asks you, what is the variation of the weights uh, or variation in the salaries of your employees? If you say that it is $2,000 square, 2000 variation in the salaries is okay, but what do you mean by dollar square? How do I interpret that? When you take the units and square it, how do we actually interpret that? Hence, People came up, again, intelligent people like you have thought for a while and they thought that, hey, we are squaring the values. Can we not take a square root again to ensure that the square is compensated for? And when you take a square root of this, you get 8.16. And when you take a square root of kg squared, Square root and square get cancelled out and you get kgs. The moment you take the square root of variance, the problem is gone. And now you can say that, you know what, there is variation in the weights of people and the variation happens to be 8.16 kgs. So you got back your original units now. Okay, so the two points that one has to remember is that units get squared. And when you take square root of variance, you get something called a standard deviation. And you have the value. Okay, kg square would become kgs. Okay. People ask this question often to me that, hey, by taking square, you are getting rid of the minus sign and the plus and minus sign are not getting, uh, are going to, I mean, would not get cancelled out when you take square. But if you take a modulus, 
if you take modulus of these values, negative value would become positive. Positive would remain as is. And then if I proceed further with the formula, these would not get cancelled out. Why are you not using modulus? Very soon in math fundamentals, we will understand that there is a concept called as derivatives. Okay, there's a concept called as derivatives. And this concept called derivatives can calculate the derivative of a square, but it cannot calculate the derivative of an individual value, that is whole raised to the power one modulus means. For this, derivative would be zero. That is all you need to understand, right? Or we can do some additional research to understand. Anyways, in mathematical foundations, we would spend some time on uh, derivatives and calculus 101 so that you get a fair bit of understanding on various other aspects. Okay. Now, there is yet another measure which is called as range. And range happens to be maximum value minus minimum value. To find out the maximum value, all you need to do is say is equal to maximum of these three values. So this gives you the max value. And if you want the minimum value, you can just say minimum value in this and that happens to be 10. Then range is nothing but maximum value minus minimum value, which happens to be 20. And then you write kgs. And if your question is, one more question which people keep asking is, why do you need variance in that case? Why can't we have standard deviation directly? It's like, when it comes to mathematics, tables, first you have table one, table two, table three, right? Three table, four table in that way. On similar lines, first people calculated variance. And over a period of time, they understood that interpretation of that was becoming difficult and hence they derived another, uh, you know, measure, which is called a standard deviation. For all practical purposes, we use standard deviation. For business interpretations, we use standard deviation. But for all math calculations in various formula, etc., Variance is used. Okay. So since first people came up with variance, and then since there were some issues with variance, they tried to counter that using uh, square root of variance, etc. But that, that is the reason why we discuss these things in this fashion. Okay. So we have variance, we have standard deviation, we have range. There is a specific riddle, as always. We will look at this riddle. And before we look into that, we also need to understand why we have n here and why do we have n minus 1 here. This n minus 1 is also related to something called as degrees of freedom. And we shall talk about this later. This is called as degrees of freedom. And remember one thing, I have this habit of introducing certain terms. And I would introduce these kind of terms on multiple occasions until you get a fair bit of familiarity with the lingo. And once that is done, I actually delve into the concept. So, Every term that I'm going to use, obviously, we are going to have a deeper discussion on that. Okay, so now let's let let me demystify this. And why do we have n here, and why do we have n minus one? So let's go back to our spreadsheet. Suppose you have a population as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, assume that this is a population that we have. And now let me take out a random sample from this. 
randomly. I've chosen one, three, four, six, seven. Randomly, I've done that. Now we have population variance, and if you want to calculate variance for population. It's represented using sigma square, and you write it as summation of i equal to 1 until n xi minus mu whole square divided by n. Okay. And when it comes to sample population, you write this as s square is equal to summation of i equal to 1 until n xi minus x bar whole square divided by n minus 1. With an Excel, we have a formula. So let me calculate first of all population variance. And if you say variance dot p, that's the formula for population variance and there we go and here when it comes to sample if you were to apply the same population formula for sample which you should not but assume you are doing that then you get a value as 4.56 So, on the sample, you're calculating population variance. If you calculate sample variance, if you apply this formula, n minus 1, let us see what happens. So, variance dot s, dot s would calculate the sample variance. And now, think about the inferential statistics. You will have population. We cannot go after the population possibly for various reasons that it would be time consuming and costly affair. Most often than not, you might not even get access to the complete population. So what do we do then? You take out the sample. And then you analyze the sample and do the calculations on sample. And then you make statements about your population. Do you want your sample measures to be closer to the population measures? Or do you want your sample measures to be far away from population measures? We don't want the sample measures to be far away from population. We want our sample measures to be closer to population. Right? So, which measure is closer to population value? Look at this population value. Is population variance formula giving you a value which is closer to this? Or is sample, is sample variance giving you a value which is closer to this? Obviously, this value is closer and that is this formula. And hence this n minus 1. You might ask me another question. Why not n minus 2? Why not n minus 3? Why not n minus 4? Do you know what, friends? Statisticians, mathematicians, economists, etc., are extremely intelligent folks who have been doing research for decades, for centuries rather. And they figure out that out of all the experiments, n minus one, if you if you divide this numerator with n minus one, it was giving values on most occasions which would be closer to the population variance. Hence they freezed on this. And this is also called as degrees of freedom, about which we will talk later. But then from this population, since you're taking one sample out, one sample is taken from this population. Hence, we are using n minus 1, just in case you are interested to you know, know further. That's the answer. Okay, so we just concluded this. And as always, we have a riddle. Okay, and we will talk about this riddle 
uh, in the next session.